Good morning everybody. Welcome to this Technique Tuesday. My name is Ali Board and I am broadcasting to you live via my studio in Dorset down in Farm Studio on the SAA's Facebook page. Now it is going out via other platforms too. So you might be watching it on a different Facebook page. You might be watching it on Catch Up as well. No matter where you are on the planet, how you're watching or what time of day or night you are are very welcome indeed. Now why is it that I am taking over the SAA's Facebook page? I'm taking it over because the fantastic team at the SAA have very kindly allowed me as part of my Dorset Art Weeks program to broadcast live to you which is a, a real honour. I am very lucky to be one of the SAA's professional partners and what that means is that there is a small steering panel where we help the SAA to uh, do what they do and in return they help us too and it's really important for artists such as myself to be able to do that. It's a very special couple of weeks for me because I am uh, what my four days in now I completely lost count uh, as part of Dorset Art Weeks. Dorset Art Weeks is where we throw open the doors of the studios. There's 300 of us taking part across Dorset so there's loads for you to see if you come and visit us in person but I like to do it online too. I like to make it virtual. I like to include you in anything that I'm doing because not everybody can get to me geographically. Now, what is Technique Tuesday? Technique Tuesday is a broadcast that I do most weeks. I don't do it every single week. I do give myself a break every now and again, but uh, it's something where we have a chat about materials, we have a demonstration, we play about, we experiment, we do all sorts of things. And I've tried really hard to build up a community of people where we meet on a Tuesday, we have a cup of coffee, uh, we have a look to see what I'm doing. We share all sorts of ideas and tips and all of that kind of thing with you today. Now, just in case you can hear a whole load of racket going on in the background, my chickens have just decided that right now is the time to lay. So I've got a whole wall of chicken sound going off in the background. Now, just in case you are uh, tuning in live, I like to say hello to people um, because people have uh, taken the time um, and effort to comment. And don't forget, if you think that this broadcast is going to be of interest to somebody then tag them in the comments if you think that they're sitting at home you think oh do you know what I know so and so who might be interested in what Ali is doing then in the comments just put the little at symbol start typing their name and click on it and then uh, they will get a notification so they can see it come up straight away there's already lots and lots and lots of you in the room so thank you for that so let's just give a bit of a shout out to see who who is around. Good morning, D. Good morning, Heather. Uh, Rabina is in the room as well. Good morning. I have a feeling I might be seeing you soon, Rabina. Um, ah, the fantastic Joe Olsop is in the room, another one of the professional partners. Good morning, lovely. Thank you very much for tuning in. That's very kind of you. Uh, Barbara in Swansea. Trudy, just down the road from me. Who else have we got? Thea, Sandra, Hilary. Lots of people tuning in. So that's wonderful. Thank you ever so much. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, I do have a whole list of things uh, just to my left, so excuse me if I glance off to the left, I have a lot of things to tell you, and a lot of things to share with you. Pop the kettle on, take me over, if I'm on a portable device, take me over to the kettle. Um, we're going to be here for uh, just under an hour, um, I have to uh, stop before the hour is up, because I've got to open the doors and let all my customers in. Um, so where can you find everything that I'm talking about to do with Dorset Art Weeks? Well, one of the first places uh, you can find is these Technique Tuesday broadcasts. I did one last week. Had a few little technical issues last week with a power cut, but we'll gloss over that. Um, so you can find uh, Technique Tuesday. So on the 10th, which was last week, today the 17th, and next week, the 24th of May, at 9 o'clock UK time, I will be doing these live broadcasts over on the SAA's Facebook page, but you can catch up with them on my Dorset Art Weeks blog Two, there is the link there. Just pop over to my artist website, alisoncboard.co.uk, and you will see all sorts of um, Dorset Art Weeks related things there. There's a little bit of information too. Dorset Art Weeks runs from the 14th to the 29th of May. 
and we're doing lots of things for it so we've got technique tuesday broadcasts we've got a daily blog i've been setting a theme every single day on that blog where we've been taking a different subject matter we've done lots of bits and pieces already uh, what have we done so far we have done ducks we've done landscapes we've done foxes uh, what else have we done? Horses. I can't think of them all off the top of my head. But basically, I set a different subject every single week, uh, every single week, every single day. And then uh, we chat about it or I share a bit of uh, tutorial or I tell you the secrets kind of behind what I do or a little bit of insight, all of those kind of things. Now, the other place you can find me is on uh, Instagram. Obviously, you can find me as an artist myself on Facebook, although I am broadcasting here with the SAA today. Just uh, put at Ali Board Artist into any search and do give me a follow, give me a like, give me a share, and you'll get to hear much more about what I do. Now, one of the things, one of the reasons uh, that we're here and one of the reasons that I'm broadcasting live on the SAA's Facebook page is to try to encourage people who you you might be out there right now you might be sitting on the sidelines thinking hmm, do I want to be a member of the SAA let me encourage you to be a member of the SAA because it doesn't matter what your experience level you can be an absolute rule beginner or you can be a seasoned professional and there's something in SAA membership just for you. One of the things the SAA does for me as a professional is constantly be there to support me, to encourage what I do, to help me, to guide me through my profession, and to also give me the opportunity to speak to people in my profession as well, which is very important. And if you're part of an art group or an art club or anything like that, then you will know that that support is fantastically important indeed. So that's one of the things that they do for me. Now, uh, what the SAA have got for you, if you're thinking about uh, becoming a member, is that they have got a fabulous offer for you. So if you pop over to the SAA's website and you're thinking about uh, becoming a member, basic membership starts at £45. Pop that code in, ACBDAW22, and you will get a fantastic free gift when you join. And the free gift is one of my watercolour pads, three tubes of watercolours, and an imitation sable brush too, which is actually worth more than your membership and then you've got membership for a whole year so you've got access to materials you've got access to tuition you've got access to support all of those things it's fabulous fabulous i can't say enough lovely things about them and about the team so shall we talk about where i am with uh the yes uh, with the dorset art weeks uh projects that i've been doing i've been uh, creating a series a kind of a new type of work all right and we started looking at it last week so like i say if you uh, haven't seen that pop back over and have a look because we'll see more about it and i want to share with you let's go to that overhead camera i want to share a little bit more with you about what we did last week so you might be thinking Thinking, well, Ali, that's not a lot of work that you've done there. Um, it's because if you know my painting style, you know that I work very impressionistically, you know I work quite fast, but this is a whole new body of work for me. This is much more down the route of illustration. I have uh, ideas of where this work is going to head, where it's going to be seen. I've got all sorts of things uh, planned for this. But one of the things I wanted to talk about today was working collaboratively and you might notice there's some text around here let's uh, lift that up uh, ever so slightly um there's some text around here which uh, i have been working with a poet a fabulous poet called andrew doughty now andrew uh is uh, lots of things he's a fabulous photographer he's a poet he understands nature really quite deeply and he and I have been having lots of conversations about the possibility of including some of his poetry and using some of his photographic inspiration in my work. So you can see here, I've got the text all the way round. And I've been including it in my work, building work around the text that he has written specially for me. And this was the piece that we started last week. I showed you how to finish off the text. If you want to see how to do that, then pop back over um, to the video archive to be able to see that. 
And last week, actually, all I was able to do within the time constraints that we had was work on this leaf. But you can probably see I've pushed it on a little bit further than that. But this week, uh, our theme of the day is not fox. It's sunflower. So I wanted to take you very quickly through how I've got to the place that I've got to with uh, one of my pieces and then you'll get to see me work on it. So just bear with me just a, a few minutes while I describe it and then uh, you can see me do a little bit of painting on it. So I, when I approached Andrew, I, I gave him a whole list of subjects that I was interested in creating work about, Sunflower being one of them, and uh, this was the poem that he came up with. Um, I'm very bad at reading poetry, so you'll have to excuse my uh, delivery, but he has written a mirthful eye blinking with Fibonacci whirls with seeds enough for a thousand birds. Now, how fantastic is that? Just full of imagery, full of beautiful words that conjure up all sorts of ideas in terms of how I might interpret that beautiful poem. And I did start with the poem. I didn't start with the image and then fit Andrew's poetry to it. And let's show you where I have started with this. Here's a bit of a selection of all sorts of bits and pieces, which is where I started. I'm gonna describe how I put all of this together, and then I'll show you where I am with the piece. Now, this might look a little bit dark in your device. It's simply because of when I bring my piece into shot, it's on a dark surface. So my apologies if you can't see them as clearly as you might like to. Good morning, anybody who has just joined us Please do pop a comment in uh, to say hello. It'd be lovely to see you. Now, where can we start? A sunflower. That is kind of the, the most obvious place to start, I think. Um, here I've got a black and white copy of an image that I found on a royalty-free website. Um, I can't actually remember which royalty-free website I found it on, but it would be either Unsplash or Pixabay or something like that. I knew that I wanted my sunflower to be flat on, to be face on. Um, so uh, this was the, the image that I chose. Um, I knew that I was going to do the center a little bit differently, but I loved the way that the, the petals were uh, created. Excuse the banging and crashing in the background. Um, so I took a tracing of that. Uh, I started spe uh, kind of experimenting with all the sort of swirls and whirls that you might find uh, around and about on a sunflower, but I had that element of it. You might wonder why it's on tracing paper. It's on tracing paper so that it gives me the ability to be able to layer things up. Okay, so I started with my sunflower. What else have we got here? Uh, I also uh, have a little bit of a Celtic theme running through some of my work because it is all based around my influences. They're all based around things that I find in my home county of Dorset. And Dorset has a very strong Celtic vibe. Actually, where I live, the hill on which I live um, was probably a Celtic settlement and certainly looks out over a very uh, famous Celtic settlement. So I've created a knotwork pattern. Uh, as, unlike last week, which was a straight uh, knotwork pattern, this one I had to create on a curve. Now again, why have I done it on tracing paper? I've done it on tracing paper so that I don't have to keep redrawing it um, and working out my spacing and working out my patterns. And also it means that I can transfer it. You can probably see where I'm heading with this. If I layer up the sunflower and the Celtic knot, you can see that one fits underneath the other. Good morning, Pippa. Lovely to have you with us. So I had my sunflower, I had my Celtic knot work, and then I started thinking about this Fibonacci uh, sequence. Now Fibonacci, just in case uh, you don't know about it, which I'm, you're all very intelligent people, so I'm sure you do know about Fibonacci. So Fibonacci is a mathematical sequence that, uh, how do I describe it? It basically is the sum of two previous parts. So the Fibonacci sequence goes like this. I'm going to write it down for you so you can see it. So it starts, it sometimes starts with a zero, but it more often starts with a one. So it's a one, a one, and then you add those two together to make two. You add those two together to make three. Add those two together to make five, eight, 
13, etc. So this is the string of numbers. This is an ancient string of numbers. This is nothing recent. It is used all the time, all the time in computer programming. It's used in algorithms. Um, but one of the things that is fascinating about the Fibonacci sequence is that it occurs in nature. So this, whilst you might not be able to necessarily uh, relate this number sequence to something natural, it does describe the way that tree branches are divided up throughout the length of the tree. It describes potentially the way that leaves are distributed on a stem. It is also, it can be found in pine cones, the way that uh, the pine cone scenes are distributed. But one of the most famous ways that it is found is in the centre of a sunflower. So let's just bring that back in. Hence the reason that Andrew used it to describe the seeds in the centre. And it describes this pattern in here. So one of the things that I wanted to do was to find the mathematical version of how those seeds are distributed in the centre of a sunflower. When all the sunflowers come out in future, go and have a look at them. You'll be able to see, and this, uh, this took me a long time to get my head around. So if you are requiring a coffee to grasp this, I absolutely get it. So the way that the pattern is constructed are eight seeds in one direction and 13 seeds in the other direction. If we look back at our number sequence again, you can see in that Fibonacci uh, distribution, you've got eight and 13 there. So we've got eight seeds uh, coming up along the left-hand swirl, and you've got 13 seeds going along the right-hand swirl. Um, please don't be under any illusions that I drew this out. No, I found a lovely mathematical site with a computer program which drew it for me and then I traced it because my maths isn't good enough. I can barely uh, add two numbers together. Um, I'm creative, I'm not a mathematician. So that is how I got my centre pattern. So I was starting to uh, kind of get all of this research together and then we started talking about, if I flick you back to Andrew's poem again, a mirthful eye blinking with Fibonacci whirls with seeds enough for a thousand birds. Now that bird imagery, really important to me. If you've ever watched any of my Technique Tuesdays previously, you'll know that I have a real affinity with uh, birds. Obviously I am an owner of chickens. Um, and so I wanted birds to be a big part of this. Uh, so where is it? I took, I took a tracing of this Fibonacci sequence. So this uh, is the way that squares are divided up into the Fibonacci sequence. So you've got one, one there, you've got two, which is double this, then you've got uh, three, so you can see you've got one third, two thirds, then you've got five, then you've got eight, and then you've got 13. And if you draw a spiral, in that across those sections what you get is this pattern here stay with me i promise i'll get to the painting in a minute <laughs> okay so i really loved this pattern this for for those of you who enjoy the maths is also related to the golden section but we won't touch on that today so i took a tracing of that and then what i started doing was uh, designing uh, bird silhouettes so if I take this tracing, you can see how I've divided up those uh, bird silhouettes to look like they are flying around that Fibonacci whirl, okay? So I had all of this, and then I started to put it together on a piece of watercolour paper. So again, my apologies that it's a little bit dark. I promise you, in a second, it will be a lot more interesting. I started with my Celtic border, I had my sunflower, I, I had my kind of Fibonacci whirl in there, but there was something about this that wasn't really gelling, even though it took me ages to draw this out. There was just something there that felt uh, out of place. And exactly the same as I uh, said last week, the thing that felt out of place was the fact that it was on white. This isn't about a sort of soft, wishy-washy, impressionistic watercolour. I needed this to pack more punch. Are you ready for this? So this 
is what I came up with and what I'm going to do is uh, zoom out very briefly so that you can see the majority of it. Now this I have obviously pushed on a little bit because I needed a starting place for today's demonstration. So this hopefully now begins to make a little bit more sense. So we've got that sunflower seed Fibonacci pattern in the centre. Although it's not desperately clear, you can hopefully just start to see the bird silhouettes occurring around that curve. Um, then I've got my sunflower I've got my Celtic knot work uh, pattern and then I've got Andrew's beautiful words around here. Now I'm not going to lie to you, the adding of these words did take me a long, long time to get the balance correct, to get the, the kind of the measuring correct. And I realized that I was never going to make my way all the way around this without a gap in it. And sometimes opportunities present themselves, don't they, where you think to yourself, um, well, I, I need something else in there. And I realized that it was a bird that I needed so that they were flying around in a pattern, but I needed something to look like it was kind of flying off the page at you. So in terms of reference material, um, you may know from previous Technique Tuesdays that uh, I've been working with the motif of a robin an awful lot. So robins are kind of uh, foremost in my head at the moment. They're sort of lurking there. And Andrew, not only, like I said, is he a wonderful poet, but he is a fabulous photographer as well. And he's given me carte blanche with his photographs to be able to use them as inspiration. So let's show you this photograph. Look at that. We have that wonderful robin that he's managed to capture there. About to land, if I remember correctly, it's about to land actually on his hand. He had some seeds in his hand as he was photographing the robins. And I thought, oh, do you know what? That is the perfect finishing spot for this kind of composition. Uh, and to put everything together. So I hope that makes sense as to why things are where they are. This is another reason why most of the, the paintings that I do, certainly when I'm teaching people how to paint or we're doing a class together, they're not going to take this amount of time, okay? This is my illustration work. This is kind of separate to the fine artwork that I do because I have some projects in mind for all of this. Um, and it's not something that we're going to be able to complete in a sitting, uh, but hopefully that does explain how I go about putting it together. Now, uh, who's uh, uh, people have popped up whilst I've been saying this. Good morning, Patricia. Uh, she's put cup of tea made, no custard creams, Kit Kats or chocolate digestives, and the washing is out. Ah, oh, that's good. Always good to get your chores done early, isn't it? Uh, you're all very welcome indeed. So what I thought I would do for you now is explain how I have started to paint this and then I'll do a little bit of robin, we'll do a little bit of petal, uh, we'll see how much time we have so that I can describe to you the materials that I use and how I place it together. So pop your feet up, all the hard work is down to me now and uh, we'll see how far we get. So the materials that I'm using for this is we've got mount board here. Uh, perhaps an unusual surface for some of you. I particularly love working on mount board because for illustration work such as this where I need really clean crisp lines it's got a lovely smooth surface. And I also like it because I can choose, I think, the, the range of mount board. I usually use De La Rowney's, uh standard uh, Studland mount board. They have about 80 colours, I think it is. So you have all of this fantastic kind of choice. Now, there is a subtle difference uh, between what I did last week and what I did this week. Let's just show you. So this is last week's, and this is nothing to do with my camera. Um, I went for a dark blue, that was twilight blue, which is easy to find. And then I realised quite accidentally, I thought I was reaching for a piece of twilight blue, and I haven't. I think I've reached uh, for a much more damsony colour, but I have to say it was fortuitous. Because if you think about your colour wheel, the yellows and the oranges and the violets and the blues are opposite each other. On the colour wheel so it's worked out very well indeed. 
I've drawn it out with uh, a combination of white trace down from all of those elements that I put together and a white watercolour pencil. That's what I've used to kind of go back over everything. And like I said, if you want to see how I put these words down, you need to go back and watch last week's Fox demonstration because I break it down of to how I do it. In terms of the paint, I use gouache. Now gouache is uh, a much more opaque paint. It's sometimes used as an addition to watercolour. I think it's a rather beautiful paint in its own right. I use it potentially a little bit differently actually. Let's show you the box that I had last week uh, where I squeeze it out into pans. I mix up those colours because I inevitably need several versions of the same colour and I mix them up in pans rather than having them out on a palette. Um, it means that I can mix up a really decent quantity of a colour and then I can go back to it every single time. It reconstitutes in exactly the same way that watercolour does. You can probably see some of the colours that I had last week for the fox that I did. Um, but I ran out of space in my tin, so I treated myself uh, to a new one. And here you've got the start of the watercolour colours. So we've got combinations of primary yellows and marigolds and spectrum yellows, all of that kind of thing. I've got my two whites here. I've got permanent white, which is the whitest white, and zinc white, which is much more of a mixing white. And even though I've got all of those I've still, you can see over here, got areas where I have been mixing them together. So I've got that uh, to one side. I'm just going to shift some things around so that I've got space. And then I've got a combination of brushes here. I've got my absolutely beloved SAA imitation sable brushes. If you are a follower of my work, you'll be thinking, crikey, Ali, they're a little bit small. <laughs> they are aren't they um i've got those i've also got uh, you can't uh, quite see but just out shot as well i've got some of the saa's silver brushes simply because this isn't the style of painting where you have one brush and you do all of it in one brush i need several brushes because i need to load them up with several colors to save me washing them out all the time. So what I thought I would do is I would show you uh, how I block in one petal, how I then outline a petal, how I go in and I add extra shading. And if we have time, we'll do a little bit of work on the robin too. So uh, let's use this camera because my <coughs> other one seems to be playing up uh, to zoom in. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, there we go, that's better. And then you can see the difference between a petal that has had just a, a sort of small amount of work, which is uh, like this one over here, and a petal which has had uh, much more work uh, done to it. So let's start with this one. And let's go, uh, which one should we go for from the get-go? Uh, let's go for my number four imitation sable brush. Same thing as always, I still have kitchen roll in my hand to be able to control that colour. I've got a pot of water over to my right hand side and I have got my selection of colours. So because this petal is at the back, I think I'm going to go for a sort of uh, a more uh, sandy kind of colour. This is a, a raw sienna version in here, so let's pick a little bit of that up take it over to the palette and what I want to do is gouache requires a little bit more palette work than you might be used to because I want to make sure that my brush is evenly coated and is of a good covering power if I make it too thin and wishy-washy it's not going to cover the dark color of the surface of my mount board so you can probably see I'm rolling my brush an awful lot in my colour and I'm doing that so that I don't get kind of blobs of colour at the end of it. So I'm rolling my brush in there and then I will bring my brush over to my kitchen roll because if you can see uh, there on the ferrule, can you see that you've got kind of spots of water? Now if I allow those to stay on the ferrule, there, and the ferrule is the metal bit, then they're going to run into the bristles of brush and they're going to affect the consistency that I've just taken ages to put together. So I 
I sort of do it automatically now, but I roll the metal part on the kitchen roll before I do any of the rest of it. And then over on here, I can swipe that color in very carefully indeed. And then I go back over to my palette. I can add more color. Now my touch on the surface is very light indeed. If I press too hard, what's going to happen is I'm going to actually physically push a space in my color, which I really don't want. I don't want it to look streaky. So I'm loading it up and I am smudging it across my surface. It might be that it needs two coats. Sometimes yellows are notorious actually for requiring a little bit of extra oomph to them to get a yellow to cover on a dark surface is quite a challenge. It's much easier with some of the other violets and greens and things. But all I'm doing for the time being is smudging that color. There's a few gaps in there, but I'm not overly concerned about those. Let's pull that color all the way down to the bottom of where the seeds start. I ran out of uh, color on my brush at the end. So whilst that's still damp, I can load my brush back up with a bit more color and I can go back in, there we go, you see you can work back into it and if necessary, when it's dry, I can add a second layer. What I try to do, very hard indeed, is to get it down in as few layers as possible because I know if I start to work back into it, then the chances are I'm going to disturb what is underneath. So I'm working, it's all still damp. The coverage isn't too bad, actually. It's not as neat and tidy as it could be, but that's because I'm demonstrating live. Um, and let's push it right up to the boundary with that next petal so that there's not a gap. I've left a gap, that's my uh, watercolor head kicking in. Um, but let's push it right up so that it looks like it's emerging from underneath. Now, if you watched last week's broadcast, you will know that there's a big shift in gouache from what it looks like when it's wet to what it looks like when it's dry. So let's show you what I mean by that. I've got my heat gun here. I'm going to pass that heat gun over the surface and you'll be able to see how it kind of shifts. Can you see it's starting to get paler? It will also start to look more opaque as it dries as well so that last little bit at the bottom there you go so can you see it's not nearly as streaky as it was when it's wet it kind of uh forms and solidifies okay we've got a little bit of texture going on in here but like i've left over here in this much brighter petal i don't actually mind that too much I quite like that it's not looking terribly flat. After all, on this one, you can see I've made an, an absolute effort to get that texture in. So let's take you over to uh, one of the other petals uh, that I have uh, finished. And you might notice that it's got uh, a pen line all the way around the edge. We'll talk about those pen lines more in just a second. What I want to do for you now is add a little bit of texture. Because I don't know about you, but uh, petals on a sunflower tend to look more like flames than, <laughs> than they do uh, actual petals themselves. So I want to add a little bit of texture back into that. Now I've got this colour on my brush, which I have a feeling might be useful, but this brush is too big. So rather than wash it off this brush, what I'm going to do is pop that brush to one side, pick up one of my uh, smaller ones. So this is an imitation size two. Let's just get that into shot so you can see that. So I'm going to wet that and I'm going to load it up with that same colour we've just been using. Uh, I'm mixing it on my palette to make that creamy consistency. And then here we go, it comes over to the tissue paper. You can see actually on the handle there, you've got a little blob of water. So I'm going to take that water off of there so that I have absolute control over what it is that we're doing. And I'm going to be working on this one. So let's swish some of that colour in up on that slightly more sort of orangey petal. And I tend to think of gouache a little bit like a sort of liquid pastel. They have very similar properties to me um, in that you can layer them up. They're quite opaque, but also you can smudge them. So I've washed that brush off. Again, I'm taking the water off of the metal part and the handle. 
um, and I'm getting the bristles so that they are damp rather than wet. And I'm going to use the damp end of the brush to smudge that kind of raw sienna -y, yellow ochre -y kind of colour into that orange. And then that way, hopefully, when it's dry, we'll get a nice blended version of one to the other. Now, what I can't do is overdo that. Can't overdo it at all because what I don't want to do is blow a hole in it. I don't want to push it so much that actually it starts to i'm actually going to show you what will happen if i overdo it okay don't worry i can i can fix it it's not a problem if i start to agitate the orange that's underneath too much can you see what happens then that dark blue of the mount board starts to shine through because i've been too heavy-handed with it but because this is gouache it's very very forgiving so what i can do is let's go back to my palette and pick up some of the orange that i used i'm just mixing it on the palette to get it the right consistency and then i can go back into it and i can fix that hole so it's very editable it's uh, very easy to correct mistakes it's just a lot more of a slower process than say your impressionistic watercolors or anything like that so let's just fix that we'll add uh, a little bit more of that raw sienna -y color back into it let's load my brush up with a little bit more and we can quickly rectify that mistake now the only way to really see how far you've come with that blending technique is to dry it. So let's get the heat gun on it, shall we? And we can see what we've got. So I know it's gonna dry back. You can see it creeping already. I will dry it a little bit. And you'll see the color start to change. There we go. And what I'm starting to get is a nice shadow occurring on that petal. What I'm going to do is add a little bit of a, a darker colour next to it. And for that, I'm going to mix some of my raw sienna gouache together. Let's get that into shot so that you can see it. I've got a little bit of my raw sienna there. And I'm going to add to it a, a tiny touch of burnt umber into there so that I get a slightly warmer version of that color so let's load my brush up go back in back onto the kitchen roll don't forget back onto there and then i can work on uh, some of these shadows that are occurring a bit further down I can do a nice little bit of negative painting against that bright yellow petal uh, going back in with my smudging technique and taking care of the ends of those petals and that is exactly how I would make my way around all of them. I would make decisions about how they're going together, about what colour selection they might need to be. Let's zoom out a little bit so you can now see that petal in context with the others. So it's starting to look more three dimensional now. It's uh, starting to come together. Now the outlining of it. I kind of do as the mood takes me it doesn't really need to happen at a particular point but the pens that I use for that are Posca paint markers and the combination of Posca and gouache to me goes together very well indeed so let's show you how I get those Posca pens in action what I do need to do before I put anything on top of this is give that a quick dry let's just give that a bit of a blast make sure that it's really quite dry indeed that will be fine so here is uh, a little colour chart that I do. Again, if you want to see how I put this colour chart together, pop back over and watch the Fox Project from last week because I explain in detail how I put one of these together. You can see uh, my little kind of um, decisions that I've made. But I also keep a, a bit of this mount board because it's nice to test my pens out on, to kind of test colours, to see how they go. These uh, little bits of extra surface are invaluable. So let's pop that on there. 
and in actually let's get rid of the painting and pop that on there because we don't want the Posca pens exploding um, and let's zoom out a little bit so that you can see what I'm doing and how I'm doing it uh, so I have uh, lots of pots of pens and implements and all sorts of things uh, littered about my desk because I don't want to be hunting for them I want to be able to just pick them up at any point uh, you can see I've got all sorts of different thicknesses and brands and, and all kinds of things but for today we are most definitely sticking with the Posca and let's show you actually let's not bother with that one let's show you that and that so we've got two different kinds of Posca pen here so a Posca pen is uh it's just the name of a product it's made by the uni pen company and if you uh, have followed my work previously you know what a big fan i am of uni pens for sketching or otherwise what makes a posca pen so interesting what makes it so interesting is that it is a paint marker so that makes it uh it's like an acrylic paint water soluble when it's wet waterproof when it's dry and they cover brilliantly you've got two different nib thicknesses here although they say the same thing but let me show you the difference so they both say you've got these two down here and this one here this is a pc 1mr this is a pc 1m and um, those are the code numbers that are assigned to them to differentiate between the two and they both say 0.7 that is the nib width but this is what's known as a pin type nib. This is what's known as a bullet shaped nib. And I will show you the difference. So let's take this one first. Now they need shaking before you use them. Okay. You can probably hear, let's find one. There you go. You can hear that ball bearing much better. The ball bearing stirs up the sediment in the pen and that's what uh, brings the opaque ink to the surface. When you first get them, you need to pump them up and down to get the ink to flow. And you do need to take a little bit of care with them. I store them nib upright so that they always have the opportunity for the reservoir to empty again. But that does mean you have to restart them. I know plenty of people that keep them horizontal so that they can just pick them up and go with them. Some people even keep them nib down, but that isn't necessarily what I would recommend because I think that makes them flood. What I do is I give it a shake I make sure that that ink is really beautifully mixed up. I take the lid off and then on my kitchen roll, I give that nib a bit of a clean because the chances are that some of the ink has flooded down into them and uh, I don't want a big blob when I start working. And then I can work on my surface and you can see straight away that it comes out really beautifully opaque. So I'm going to zoom in so that I can then start to show you the difference between the nib widths. Okay, so this is that pin type you can see, like a fine liner, that kind of thing. This is, uh, unsurprisingly, yellow. Now we have, hopefully, exactly the same pen. So it's still yellow, it's still 0 0.7, but you can see there it says bullet shaped. So let's give it a shake. <laughs> you'll see the state of it straight away as well and you'll see the different shape in the nib so it's slightly different and whilst it is a 0 0.7 I haven't shaken it nearly well enough ah. um, you will see that you can achieve there we go a slightly fatter line it's got a different quality to it can you also see how important it is to shake them there, I didn't do anything else to it, I didn't clean it, I didn't wipe it, I didn't pump it up and down, but that is the pen when I haven't shaken it particularly well, and that is the pen when I have shaken it well. So you can see the covering power of it too. So you just get the sort of two different qualities of line with these two pens. Both of them are going to suit my project marvellously. And just in case you're wondering about where you get hold of these, in the comments of uh, this Facebook live feed, or on catch up or if you're watching this via my blog on the website I've included the links to where you can find all of these materials just please be aware that those are affiliate links and what that means is that I do receive a few pennies if you happen to purchase and what it does is just keep these demonstrations free to you so that you don't have to pay for them that's uh, how this uh, type of thing works so i've got my pens there now the one i actually want to shake up is this one which is uh, a 1mr it's the 0.7 but it's gold instead of yellow 
So let's give it a really good shake. Is that enough? Oh, I haven't cleaned it. I haven't cleaned it. So let's give that a really good wipe on there. Make sure that I don't get a blob. Let's test it out. Yes. So can you see, not quite as bright a colour, but funnily enough, super perfect for this petal here. And what I can do is if I want to tidy up the edges of my work or I want to give it a contrasting outline, what I can do is use my Posca pen around the periphery of my petal and it just finishes it off. It crisps it up. And I quite like the fact that actually it's a little bit metallic and so you've got a little bit of bling there going on. And I want to uh, develop that theme here in that sunflower seed section where the seeds are, that Fibonacci sequence that we had. So for that, I've got a selection of browns and I've got uh, a couple of different uh, paint pens going on. Uh, so let's show you a couple of these and how I put these together. And that will probably be uh, enough before we part company today. So let's go back to my brushes. Um, I've got brushes everywhere. Where's my number two brush gone? Put it down somewhere. Now I can't find it. There it is. There it is. Couldn't find it at all. So I've got on my palette a combination of uh, burnt umber. I know that looks very dark in the camera. And then you've got, um, uh, I think this was a, a Venetian red or something similar. Let's tip it into the light so you can see it a bit more and my whites and my oranges and what I've done is create a sort of little palette of browns here that I can pick and mix from to complete these sections. So let's go for this one. We had a sort of nice, I think I had the burnt umber and one of the oranges mixed together. The colour mixing for something like this isn't as imperative for me to understand and to make note of because I will always leave the colours on my palette to be able to be picked up and be used again. So as long as I have a vague idea, then it's okay. So I've got my sort of ready brown in there and I will use my lovely fine brush to fill in that little section. I haven't quite decided how I'm gonna finish all of these off yet, but this certainly gives you a bit of an idea of how to use slightly different materials. We can pop that in let's do another one let's do let's do a nice dark one up here actually where's my darkest brown i think it's that one there so this is uh, more burnt umber than anything else in fact i think it's just burnt umber on its own yes it is and i'm coating my brush exactly the way i have done before loading it up with that creamy consistency taking the moisture off the ferrule so we'll get that nice dark one in there uh, coming around that shape, filling in those last little areas. This um, number two brush, oh, I have just run out of paint. This number two brush gets into those nooks and crannies really beautifully, completely beautifully. And we'll give that a blast with the hair, with the hair, hair gun. What's a hair gun? A cross between a heat gun and a hair dryer. That's what it is. You can see how they dry much more opaque as the moisture is taken away from them. And then you can see that I've already started, I haven't quite completed, but I wanted those Fibonacci points to uh, be a contrast. And so for that, I went back to my Posca pens. So this is a slightly bigger one. This is the PC3M bullet shaped, but this is somewhere between 0.9 and 1.3. And the reason that they give that kind of variegation in the nib width is because it depends on how hard you press. Now this is bronze, so you've got, that's why it's got a bit of a shine on here. I'm just gonna shake it away from the camera, <laughs> just in case. And uh, let's get my test piece in to see how that is faring. Yes, that's, mm, could I? Mm, I was just about to say, have I done it enough? I don't think I've done it quite enough. Let's give it a bit of an extra shake. And, and get that in, that's better. And then what I did was go back over it, oh, I do need my glasses for this, and fill in those dots. I have a feeling I'm gonna do something else to those dots, but for the purposes of today's demonstration, let's pretend I'm not, and we'll get one in over there. So you can start to kind of join things up, 
and it's a nice way for getting some detail in. Now I did, where's my, oh here it is, um, I've got a different brand of pen because I can't find an extra fine brown in Posca. So I had to go for a, a different make for that. But all of these things I tell you and talk you through in last week's project. And then what I'll do is, you see I've got a, a bit of a nasty white trace down line in there. What I can do is tip X that out with my Posca pen by going back over the top of it. And what that does is just give a nice finish to the painting that I have already done. So I'm hoping that gives you, whilst it is a tiny amount of the project uh, put in, you can start to see how I put things like this together. Now just to very quickly talk you through, don't disappear on me yet, I've got uh, a few things uh, to recap with you. Um, I've done the knot work in a very similar way, I mixed up this pale lilac colour and I filled that in but I've gone back in with a contrasting Posca pen this time in a deeper violet. And I've started to block in the robin with the gouache too. So you can see I've gone for a much more painterly effect on there to kind of simulate feathers. But I will be going back in with the Posca pens to uh, give this robin definition because don't forget, the robin is the thing that's ahead of everything else in my composition. So that robin has really, really got to stand out. But I hope that gives you a little bit of insight into how I might put a project like this together. Now, if um, this is the kind of work that interests you, obviously I can't put this stuff together quickly. This is not something where I can make it all happen in one sitting. Plus the fact, if you've been following this work, I've got a fox on the go, I've got hair on the go, I've got the sunflower on the go. And next week for Technique Tuesday, uh, we're going to be coming back together the last of my takeovers of the SAA page. I'm going to be doing a cobweb because Andrew has written me another poem for cobweb. So uh, I've got to get cracking on that demonstration as well. But keep your eyes peeled later in the year for news all about how those pieces have come together, what I've done with them, where you can see them, all of that kind of stuff. It's a project that is bubbling away in the background. It's just because I like sharing stuff with you. I wanted to tell you all about it. Now, don't disappear on me. Don't disappear on me yet. <laughs> Um, I've just got a few things uh, to recap with you. Like I said, if you're watching this live on uh, Facebook, thank you very much uh, for tuning in today. Thank you for all your comments. Um, and don't forget that SAA uh, joining offer. This is the code that you want, ACBDAW22, for you to receive that rather fabulous free gift. Now, there's some other things that uh, you can find on my social media that are happening every day. I'm writing a blog, giving you insight into what I do and how I do it. I'm sharing some links to the video on demand tutorials that I do with the SAA, which means that even if you're not a member, you're going to be able to access that tuition for the duration of Dorset Art Weeks. Very exciting and very generous of the SAA to be able to do that. If you want to watch this again, if you wanted to kind of slow it down and see how I used the gouache and how I went back into those petals, you can watch it on the SAA's Facebook page or you can watch it on the Dorset Art Weeks blog, however you like to access those types of things. Now I do have, uh, if you are an SAA member and you like to attend workshops, I have a workshop coming up in July, which is Rufus Fox. Uh, pop over to the community part of the page to either come to HQ up in Newark and take part with me on the day, or you'll be able to join in live if you're a member as well. Now I have a, a few thank yous to make, just uh, bear with me. Uh, first thank you is uh, to the SAA team, to everybody that helps me out. You will know uh, lots of them by name, obviously uh, Gary, uh, who does the, the filming in the background, the lovely Mel, who um, is so supportive, and Anita, their artist in residence. But I have very particular thank yous to make. Um, I want to thank uh, Tara, 
and Chrissy and Carla and Sam because those four wonderful ladies have been instrumental in putting all of this together and encouraging me to share it all with you lovely people. Uh, I want to thank Andrew. Give Go over to various social medias and give Andrew Doughty a follow. So it's Andrew Doughty Poet and Doughty is spelt D-O-U-G-H-T. T Y. Give him a follow. You'll be able to see more of his work. Um, I'm going to leave you today with his poem because I think it is exceptionally beautiful. And join us again next week when I will be doing that spider web and I will be sharing even more techniques and Andrew's beautiful poetry with you. So until I see you either coming through that door as part of Dorset Art Weeks, do come and see me. I would love to have a chat with you. I'll pop the kettle on. I'll even crack the biscuits open or online. You take lots of care of yourselves, won't you? And I will see you very soon. <laughs> Bye.